still the blood that saves from sin. It's still the blood that cleanses within. From the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea, it is still the blood of Jesus that brings victory. Talk a little bit this evening about uh, John the Baptist. How many of you are familiar with uh, John the Baptist and his story? Well, I'd like to talk about John the Baptist in a way that uh, I haven't really ever heard him talked about. And in order to be able to do that, you kind of also have to understand some of the history of the nation of Israel. But before I get too far into my own message, I'd like to read our passage for this evening. It's uh, John chapter number 1, verses number 22 through 29. Beginning in verse number 22, it says, Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And this is uh, verse number 23 of John chapter number 1. It says, He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. He it is, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. Now we see here what ultimately is the conclusion of about 2200 year, or about 2100 years of godly promise and prophecy. And to understand that, you have to go back in, in the nation of Israel's history, but that's ultimately what this passage is. It's not, it's not uh, an introduction to the Lord Jesus. It's the conclusion of everything before the Lord Jesus. How many of you are familiar with the history of the nation of Israel? And, and it's not something that is, is necessarily all the time talked about. Of course, we do talk about the different things in the, in the history of the nation of Israel, but we don't necessarily look at the history as a whole unless you're taking like a Bible class and then you'll learn about the history of the nation of Israel. But in order to understand the significance of John and his, and his message, you have to understand the history of the nation of Israel. Who knows where the history of the nation of Israel begins? The nation of Israel's history begins with a promise made in Genesis chapter number 15, which of course if you were here on Sunday morning, uh, my dad preached out of Genesis chapter number 15, but God makes a promise in Genesis 15 that He would make Abraham's seed a great nation, and through his seed might all nations be saved. Of course we know from Galatians chapter number 3 that... Um, the Lord Jesus Christ is the seed specifically mentioned in Genesis 15 because it says in Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number, uh, if I'm, I've flipped past it, 3, uh, I've lost my page, 3.16, now, Abraham, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. But all the way back in Genesis 15, God makes a promise to Abraham. Of course, at this time he's Abram, but he makes a promise to Abraham that he will make of Abraham's seed a great nation. And from then, from that promise of not only a great nation, but of the Redeemer, because that's ultimately what the promise was, was for the Redeemer, from that promise, all the way until the time of John, in John chapter number 1, you see faith toward the promise of a Redeemer. Of course, we know from Romans chapter number 4 and verse number 3, for what saith the Scripture, Abraham believed God and his faith, and it, was counted unto him, and, his, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. His faith was counted unto Abraham for righteousness. It wasn't his actions, it wasn't what he did that made him 
righteous before God. It was his faith. So even though you have the sacrificial system given to Moses, it still required faith. What was the number one problem that the nation of Israel consistently had? It was a lack of faith in God. From the time of Moses, where they all were, they all were faithless when they sent spies through Kadesh Barnea into the promised land and they came back with a, with a faithless report and the nation of Israel was faithless to believe the good report of Caleb and Joshua. So there was a lack of faith then. When they finally went into the land as promised, they did not have the faith to complete the commandment of God and drive out the inhabitants of the land. From the time of the judges, as soon as one judge died, they would immediately reject God and go follow after the Canaanite gods. There was lack of faith there. Saul, the first king of Israel, had a lack of faith because he was a, he was a man king. He had faith in his own abilities. And he, he lacked the faith in God to lead the country. And David, of course, had faith in God, but he had lapses in his own faith because he wanted things in his own strength, like his sin with Bathsheba. Solomon had faith in God at the beginning of his reign, but at the end of his reign, he went after other false gods because of the strange wives that he had. That's not strange in the terms of they were weird. It's strange in the terms of they were not godly people. They were not Israelite women. He had strange wives. And because he had strange wives, he went out after false gods. And the result is that after the reign of King Solomon, the nation of Israel split into the northern ten tribes, the nation of Israel, and the southern two tribes, the nation of Judah. It's interesting to note that the ten northern tribes that split off were the ten tribes from whom the spies, all the way back in, uh, in Exodus, that were, all the spies were from, that gave ill reports were from those northern ten tribes, and Caleb and Joshua were from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, which were the two good report tribes, and that, that became the later nation of Judah. It's interesting to note. So you have the nation of Judah, which had mostly faithless but occasionally faithful kings. And then you have the nation of Israel, who had complete faithless kings. And, and throughout their history, both nations struggled with faith in God. And ultimately, the result is that in 722 BC, the nation of Israel was destroyed and carried off into captivity by the Assyrians. And in 586 BC, the nation of Judah was destroyed and carried off into captivity by the Babylonians. Now, I say all that to say this, after the return to Jerusalem from Babylonian and then Persian captivity from the remnants of the nation of Judah, they knew that the reason why they had been destroyed in the first place was because of a lack of a faith in God. And so they very stringently, they very strictly went and tried to have a system that promoted faith in their one God. And that ultimately is what gave rise to the Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? We see them mentioned in the New Testament all the time. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the, nation, of the people in Jerusalem and, and Israel after the remnant's return. Here's the thing. Their faith in God very quickly became a set of rules to follow. And so they lost the actual faith in God and simply did what they thought they were supposed to do and it got to the point where if, if you were a Pharisee you thought because I do all the things I'm supposed to do I really can't do any wrong and it just it ultimately devolved into a lack of faith in God anyway because they had a faith in their own actions. Right. Along comes John the Baptist. Now this is 400 or so years after the last prophet of Israel or Judah has died. There has not been a prophet of God for all this time, and here comes John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is the last prophet of the faith in the promise of the Redeemer. Because without John the Baptist's, uh, without the Redeemer being present, they all had the faith in the promise of the Redeemer. So what made John the Baptist different from all, even the other faithful Jew, Jews of the day who were practicing Jews who had the faith in the promise of the Redeemer? John the Baptist didn't just have faith in the promise. 
he looked forward to the appearance of the Redeemer. And he proclaimed that the Redeemer is coming. So even though he didn't know when that was going to happen, even though he didn't know who it was going to be, he still had the faith to go forward with God and to go forward in faith. And what we see at the bank of the Jordan River is that the fulfillment of that promise is finally realized by John the Baptist. Every single prophet leading up to John lived by faith in this promise of a Redeemer. They all foretold it. None of them saw it this side of heaven, except John the Baptist. But had they not had the faith and the promise, there wouldn't have been the lineage of faithful people to result in people like John the Baptist who were the voice crying in the wilderness saying, make straight the way of the Lord. Had there not been people who were willing to have faith in something that they couldn't see, we wouldn't have John able to see what he had faith in. Because Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. Even the Pharisees knew of the promise of the Redeemer, but they only looked to the author of the promise. God, the author of the promise, made that promise in Genesis 15. Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of that promise in John 1. John the Baptist was the only one looking for the fulfillment of the promise. There are too many Christians today who have the author of their faith, but are not looking forward to the finisher. If we, are, if we walk with just the author... We never actually progress forward. It's really hard to, look, to go forward if you're looking straight up. But if you go forward in faith, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, you can go through with God. There's an old hymn. It's not in our Redback hymnal, but it's, it's commonly sung at the Crown College. It's, Go Through With God. It says, the call of God, it is so clear, but friendship's call and home is dear. How lonely was the road he trod, or wilt thou not go through with God? Go through with God, thy vows to pay, thy life upon the altar lay. The Holy Ghost will do the rest and bring to thee God's very best. What is the difference between the modern Christian and the ancient Hebrew in terms of our faith? The difference is that the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ meant that the Holy Spirit no longer was separate from the people who were faithful. Because the reason why the Israelites had the complex tabernacle structure, they had the complex temple structure, is because in the Holy of Holies, that is where the Spirit of God dwelt. And if they wanted to go forward with God, they had to physically pick up a tent and move it. The Bible says that you are the temple of God. That's not, that's not just to say, oh, take care of it. That's to say that the Holy Spirit, which once indwelt the literal temple, because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, now indwells you. And you can go forward with God because God already indwells you. You don't have to pick up a tent. You just have to pick up your feet. And sometimes, picking up your feet means you have to go stand out in a dirty, smelly, stinky Jordan River that's really cold, even though you don't know why, because one day your faith will be sight, and the Lord will come down the riverbank, and you'll be able to see what it all was for. But you can't have the blessing of your faith being sight if you don't have the faith to go forward in it. How many of you have ever watched 
a TV show that was a, that was a series that consistently came out with new episodes that built on each other. Whenever a new episode came out, you would watch it, correct? Even though you didn't know when the show would end, you still watch the next episode. How would, it, how would it affect your relationship with that show, your ability to understand what the show meant, if you just watched the same episode 17 times instead of watching all the new episodes that came out? That's what a lot of Christians do. They get to one spot with God. They say, this is pretty nice. This is all I'm going to do. And I'm not going to move forward. They get to one solitary spot and they connect with their author and they do absolutely nothing with the finisher. Because a lot of Christians get comfortable. God doesn't want us to be comfortable. He wants us to, he wants us to be faithful and He will provide the comforter. Right. When Peter stepped out on the boat, or out of the boat onto the Sea of Galilee. He could have stayed in the comfort and safety of the boat. But the safest place to be was standing on the water next to the Lord Jesus. Because he didn't have to worry about sinking in the boat because he was right next to the Lord. Now the other interesting thing to notice about that specific instance in history is that Peter started to sink because he noticed all the things around him got his eyes off the Lord. And straightway, the Lord Jesus plucked him up out of the water. Which means that Peter was an arm's length away from incarnate God and still lost sight of what he was supposed to be doing. So it's easy, it is very easy, to get lost in what you're doing and everything just like the Pharisees did. That is the exact reason why the Pharisees did what they did is because they got bogged down in what they're doing that they completely forgot who they're doing it with. That's the, big, that's the big word, is with. It's not for, because if you do it for, then it's reckoned of debt. Because if you go back to Romans chapter number 4, it says in verse number 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Right. When you get to a point where you start thinking that you're doing things for God, then you're very, very close to completely getting away from what God wants you to do anyway. Mm -hmm. Because God doesn't want you to do things for him. If he wanted things done, he would have done it himself. Because how good are we compared to God? It's not about getting things done. It's about going with God. Jesus Christ didn't come to the earth so that He could immediately just forgive everybody of their sins. He wanted people to come unto Him. That was the whole point of His earthly ministry is that if you draw nigh unto Me, I will draw nigh unto you. Right. You have to go forward with God. You have to have the faith to go forward with God in order for your life to, to start having purpose. The purpose is not in the action. The purpose is not in the comfort. It's in the walk. You have to go forward with God. Go through with God. Thy vows to pay, thy life upon the altar lay. The Holy Ghost will do the rest and bring to you God's very best. Because if you don't have the faith to go through with God then you're relying on your own strength. And ultimately, none of us are any strong at all. Samson learned that in a, in a terrible way. That when he relied on his own strength, he very quickly lost it. And so, he found that he was nothing without God. Right. John was nothing without God. When he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, it wasn't an introduction. It was the conclusion of his earthly ministry. He had nothing more to say because his earthly ministry was to proclaim that the Lord Jesus was coming and then the Lord Jesus was there. 
and there was nothing more to say because he did what he was instructed to do by God. He had the faith to go forward and do it, and he had the blessing to see it completed. Imagine being able to be in John's shoes, to have all that 2,100 years of knowledge of faith in the promise of the Redeemer, to see the faith become sight. We have the, we, they had faith in the promise of the Redeemer. We have faith in the presence of the Redeemer. The Redeemer has already come and propitiated for your sin, but He's still coming again. He's coming again. Right. That's the finisher of our faith because He's coming again. He was the author of your faith at the cross, and by faith in that you can be made whole again, but he hasn't finished it yet. And we know that from Philippians chapter number 1 and verse number 6. It says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He's begun a work in you. Now, you didn't start the work. Because if you started the work then it wasn't of God. He has begun a work in you, but it doesn't say that He's finished it. It says He'll perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Right. He's coming, but He's not here yet. And so you can't know exactly what God has in store for you all the time. But let me ask you this. How many of you have, have ridden in a car or have driven a car that your headlights reach from here to your house. They do if you drive forward. You can't always see all the way to your destination. You can only have the faith to go the way that is illuminated before you. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know what those little lamps that that, that psalm is referencing you know what they were? They were little tiny clay pots and all they had was this little flame that came up off of the end of it. They actually had special shoes that they would sometimes wear where the pot would sit on the shoe. And all it, all it was good for was illuminating your next step. All it was good for was showing you where to put your foot next. It wasn't going to tell you the rest of the path ahead. But you had, the faith, you had to have the faith to step forward. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It will reveal itself to you if you have the faith to go forward with God. If you don't understand what's going on in your life, take a step back and ask God to reveal it. Right. Take a step back and ask yourself, what is the next thing that I know that I have to do? And if you know what you have to do next, do it. It's that, it's that simple. It really is. If you know what you have to do next, do it and have the faith that God will reveal the step after that to you. Because He will. And when that step is revealed to you, do it. And move on to the next step. And the next step. And eventually you'll find that you've made it all the way to the destination that He originally intended for you. It's not always easy to do. It's not always easy to see where the next step is. But if you have the faith to go through with God as John did, then God will have the faith to walk with you and show you where He wants you to go. Amen. It's still the blood that saves from sin. It's still the blood that cleanses within From the highest star in heaven To the depths of the sea It is still the blood of Jesus That brings victory